Today we are going to be discussing the process of anti-differentiation, which is essentially reversing the differentiation process. So what we're looking for are antiderivatives. Those are things that have particular functions as their derivatives. So suppose we know that g prime is 2x. What could g of x be? Well, we recognize 2x as the derivative of x squared. So g of x equals x squared is a possible answer. That's a function that has 2x as its derivative. But it's not the only possibility. g of x could be x squared plus 4, or x squared minus 23, or x squared plus c for any constant c, since when we differentiate c, we get 0. We call g of x equals x squared an antiderivative for 2x, an, not the, and g of x equals x squared plus c, the general antiderivative for 2x. The idea is cap f of x is an antiderivative for little f of x if the derivative of cap f is little f, and we note that if two functions have the same derivative, they differ by at most a constant, which means that if you take any antiderivative and add a constant to it, you've got the general antiderivative. So for example, let's let f of x equal cosine x. Let's find the general antiderivative. Well, we remember that the derivative of sine is cosine, which means that sine is an antiderivative for cosine, and the general antiderivative is going to be sine plus c. Now, we're going to establish some rules for anti-differentiation that come from differentiation rules. So the power rule for differentiation tells us that the derivative of x to the n is nx to the n minus 1, and if we replace n by n plus 1, we can see that n, x to the n plus 1 prime is n plus 1 x to the n. Now what we remember is that constants factor in and out of derivatives. The derivative of a constant times f of x is that constant times f prime of x. So we can take this expression up here, divide through by n plus 1, and we get the following. The derivative of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 is x to the n as long as n plus 1 is not 0. And now why this is worth something is since this derivative is that, the antiderivative or an antiderivative for x to the n is this, x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. And that says the general antiderivative is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c for f of x equals x to the n, unless n equals minus 1, in which case we'd get a 0 here. So we don't know what the antiderivative for x to the minus 1 is, but for every other power of x, this formula tells us the general antiderivative. So for example, if f of x is 1 over the square root of x, we can write that as x to the minus 1 half, that's the same sort of a power rule as we've been talking about here, where n is minus a half. So we look, minus a half plus 1 is our exponent up here. Minus 1 half plus 1 is our denominator there, plus the arbitrary constant c. Minus 1 half plus 1 is a half. So we get an a one-half as an exponent, and when you divide something by a half, it's the same as multiplying by two. So two x to the one-half plus c is the general antiderivative. By the way, you can check to see that you've gotten things right. If this is an antiderivative, when you take its derivative, you should get back where you started. So the derivative of this is two times one-half x to the minus one-half, and when you do that, you end up with 2 times 1 half, which is 1, x to the minus 1 half. That's what we started with. Okay, so this thing is the general antiderivative. 
Now, there are nice linear properties for derivatives, and as a result, there are nice linear properties for antiderivatives. So if we have cap F being an antiderivative for little f and cap G being an antiderivative for little g, then when we differentiate a cap f of x plus b cap g of x, we end up with a f prime plus b g prime, which is a little f of x plus b little g of x. And if you read what this says, it says this object right here is an antiderivative for that. And that tells us now we got a nice property here. So if we want to find an antiderivative for a f of x plus b g of x, we find an antiderivative for little f, we find an antiderivative for little g, and the answer is going to be a times that antiderivative plus b times that other antiderivative. So constants factor in and out, and the antiderivative of a sum is the sum of antiderivatives. So, for example, let's find the general antiderivative for 3x to the fourth minus 2 cosine x. The basic idea is find an antiderivative for x to the fourth, find an antiderivative for cosine x. And an antiderivative for x to the fourth is x to the fifth over 5, right? x, x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. And as we saw before, an antiderivative for cosine x is sine x. So the general antiderivative is 3 times the antiderivative for x to the fourth minus 2 times the antiderivative for cosine plus r c, the arbitrary constant. If you look at the tables that we have accumulated so far for derivatives, every one of these has an anti-differentiation formula associated. The derivative of x to the n was nx to the n minus 1. What we saw is that gave us antiderivative of x to the n is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. The derivative of sine is cosine, which means the antiderivative of cosine is sine plus c. The derivative of cosine is minus sine, which means the antiderivative of minus sine is cosine, and now when you multiply through by minus 1, that tells you that your antiderivative of sine is minus cosine plus c. The derivative of tangent is secant squared, which means the antiderivative of secant squared is tangent plus c. Derivative of secant is secant tangent. Antiderivative of secant tangent is secant plus c. And now here's that nice linear property that we talked about for derivatives, and it gives us this nice linear property for antiderivatives. A warning, we told you about product rule and quotient rule for derivatives. There are no equivalent formulas for antiderivatives. So the nice linear stuff is true, but Nothing about products, nothing about quotients. Finding those antiderivatives is going to be harder. Now, let's talk about initial conditions. And what we mean here is that if you have f prime of x equals 2x, we cannot determine f of x uniquely. There's an arbitrary constant involved. The antiderivative is going to be x squared plus c. But if we have a little more information, the value of f of x at a particular point, we can determine that constant. And if we knew, for instance, that f prime of x was 2x and f of 1 was 3, the antiderivative, the general antiderivative of f of x is x squared plus c. And then we're going to use the fact that f of 1 equals 3 to determine c. And what we do is we just plug in 3, which is f of 1. But now we know f of 1 looks like this, which is 1 squared plus c. So 3 equals 1 plus c, and c equals 2. And that makes our antiderivative of x squared plus 2. By the way, this f of 1 equals 3 is called an initial condition. It tells you the value of the function at a particular point.
This is particularly useful when we start thinking about position, velocity, and acceleration. We already know that the time derivative of position is velocity, and the time der derivative of velocity is acceleration. So what that says is s prime of t is v of t, and v prime of t is a of t. If we know s of t, we can differentiate to find v of t, and then we can differentiate that to find a of t. To go the other way, from a, a of t to v of t, and then to s of t, we will have to anti-differentiate twice. And what we've seen then is we need initial conditions, and because we're doing it twice, we're going to need two initial conditions. So for example, suppose a of t is 12t squared plus 4, v of 0 is 1, and s of 0 is 3. We want to find s of t. We've got a of t, so we're going to start by anti-differentiating a of t to find v of t. So we've got a 12, which is there. The power rule says the antiderivative of t squared is going to be t cubed over 3, and t to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Antiderivative of 4 is 4t, right? Because the derivative of 4t is 4. And we have our arbitrary constant, and 12 times t cubed over 3 is 4t cubed. So this is what we know without using any initial conditions, but we have v of 0 equals 1. So we're going to use that, plug into here, and we're going to get 1 is v of 0, which is 0 plus 0 plus c. And that makes c equal to 1. And when we plug that back into here, we get that v of t is 4t cubed plus 4t plus 1. Now, we anti-differentiate this, v of t, to get s of t. And again, we got a 4 sitting out in front. Antiderivative of t cubed is t to the 4th over 4, t to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. For t, this is t to the 1st. That becomes t squared over 2 times the 4. Antiderivative of 1 is t plus our arbitrary constant. And finally, we use that s of 0 is 3, and we plug into this formula that we just got. We get 3 equals 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus c. So c is 3, and s of t is 4, t to the 4th is t squared, 4t squared over 2 is 2t squared, t, and c was 3.